I guess I will call it this tape the sheep herding years, the reforming years of my life. When I was 11 years old, I got a chance to go out in Willis Creek and herd sheep for 31 days. And uh, I guess it was springtime in the Rockies because I was right under those beautiful orange flaming cliffs of Bryce Canyon National Park. Quite a lot of wonderful things happened to me out there. I was left alone three days and three nights on the range alone when I was 11 years old. And uh, I remember Dad had given me a, a little 25 cent pocket knife and I carved HP on some trees, pretty big H's and P's. And later on in life, when I went through that grove of quick in Aspen, Upper Willis Creek, somebody wrote high power. They didn't know what the HP stood for. And I was quite amused at that. Um, I found my first fossil in Willis Creek that year when I was sheep herder, and uh, it was sent to the Smithsonian by Dr. Herbert E. Gregory, and it's never been duplicated to this very day. And I found dinosaur bones in Willis Creek while I was 11 years old. Beautiful little vertebrae. But anyway, that's how I started out herding sheep. Dad was a sheep man most of his life. He went into the sheep business when I was very, very young, so young I can hardly remember. And he gave me a little burrow, and uh, I remember riding a little burrow when I was a youngster out around the sheep camp. But uh, he took uh, Grandpa Davis's place, the shearing trail, and 13 inches of sleet and hail and and ice came out of the sky and killed 1,000 head of his sheep just before lambing, and that broke him, and for a few years, he didn't have any sheep. And then Dad went into the sheep business again. But before Dad went into the sheep business, I herded sheep for other people, like Frank Alfred, the neighbor, lived just east across the street. And I herded up around Pine Lake then. But uh, when I got a little older, uh, 12 years old, I spent the entire winter down in the lower country, most of it around underneath the nipple in what we call the swag. And was, I was an Uncle Lorem Pollock with a herd of bucks. We lost two bucks and we hunted and hunted and hunted and couldn't find them. And uh, finally I found them one day, they'd uh, been fighting in a deep wash and they'd, their horns had interlocked and they died uh, locked together. I remember one day I was crawling around in some ledges, didn't have much to do, and I found a masonry hole completely masoned up with rock and mud, broke into it, and there's about a number three tub full of pinots, old old, old pinots, had a little old brown bead in them, side of them, very reesty, and, and but uh, they'd been put there for storage and forgotten. I had the, some of the good experiences, the foundation of my sheep herder days is what uh, led me into thinking very seriously of the beautiful earth. And uh, being a shepherd of the mortal flocks of sheep, I guess I become one of the one of the best detectives to find lost sheep that ever was. I, it just simply filled filled my niche. And later on in life, I used this knowledge of how to find things. But the good Lord blessed me with the uh, memory. Once I saw something, and once it was established in my mind, I never forgot it. Then by the time I would got up into my teenagers, why Dad went back into sheep herding business again, he rented a herd from W.J. Henderson, and um, then I began to make it a full-time vocation of herding sheep. And uh, 
I'm quite proud to say that when we come to the Sheeran Trail every May that my sheep were the strongest and the fattest and I had the least losses of any of the sheep people. I went through colossal hard winters and uh, some of the memories uh, as I go back to two winters, 36 and 37, 32 and 33, I'll never forget. In 32 and 33, Island and I were on the Buckskin Mountain, called the Kaibab Plateau. We were still in Kane County, this side of the Arizona line, when a blizzard came up. I'd been out uh, quite a while. I got married that in October, and, uh, and the circumstances came up. Mother was pregnant with her last baby, Lemoyne, and uh, and uh, Dad was in the bishopric and terribly busy. And Island and I were out, and a blizzard came up, and my whiskers was quite long, and I was thought I would love to come home to, for Christmas, but circumstances said no. Uh, we I told Island to move the camp into a sagebrush because I could just feel the weather. It was cold, it was a hard blow, uh, southwest wind blowing, and it just looked like a, a solid sheet of ice or snow coming. So I told Island to take the sheep uh, camp into a certain place where there was lots of sagebrush and lots of cedars and uh, I would bring the sheep. I got to a big red knoll and the, quite a lot of big cedar trees on it and the wind was blowing, I guess, maybe 50 miles an hour. And I uh, set a big tree on fire and it was just blossomed into flame. When the, that blizzard came, I, I had the sheep all rounded up in a tight wad and it just moved them until they come to the first little depression or gorge or canyon, whatever you want to call it, in the Buckskin Mountain, and there they just hovered up. And in moments, they were just a white mold. I went back to my fire. I don't believe I was gone uh, more than 30 minutes. The fire was out and the snowdrift was taking the place of where the fire was. I knew about what direction I had a pair of heavy shaps on and uh, goggles over my eyes and a heavy sheepskin coat on, and it was just one solid cake of ice. I rode towards camp in, in this terrible blizzard. I couldn't see, but I could hear, and Island was out chopping cedar trees to keep the tent from blowing down, making a windbreak, and when we rode in the next morning, we had 18 inches of fresh snow on the ground, and it was still snowing. I got up in the darkness of the early morning, and we got breakfast. The mules uh, we had a bell on them, and we could hear them. Island slipped out in the snow and found the mules. They weren't very far away and brought them into camp. We drained them. At the break of day, we had two big, fat, husky dogs, and... and very inactive, but this day we put them to work. I rounded that herd of sheep up and brought them into this great big sagebrush flat, maybe, oh, two miles square, and then out into the edge of the cedar trees was also a lot of sagebrush. I uh, made the sheep in a big fan and then with our horses and the two fat dogs, we uh, put the sheep in sort of a crescent shape like a new moon. We begin to dog and we been, begin to push and we screamed and we hollered and we pushed those sheep out to the edge of the sagebrush flat and into the cedars. Then we'd turn them around and push them right back across the same trails and we'd done that all day long. The snow got deeper and deeper and deeper. Finally, on the north slopes, there was as much as five feet of snow. We never had a chance to leave those trails that I made that day. We, uh, we stayed right within those trails. 
where people lost their whole herds and some of them in, uh, up around a thousand mark 800 we lost 160 we had lots of little lambs and they got a disease uh, called sore mouth and we used to dip their little face down in coal oil uh, we always had a little bit of coal oil in our supply house and that would uh, this disease would come from eating the crusted snow and that break their lips and then infection had set in and then it passed from one to another that's where a big our biggest loss was but we did lose a few the very oldest froze to death i remember one time i had to go su for supplies and and um, island went with me and kenneth golden from out the sheep camp in this terrible cold winter this was in february in the coldest day of my entire life uh, when we got into pre well, they brought ken golden in he'd gone snow blind and couldn't see a bit he was blind as a bat so we held a conference in the old ghost town of pre that night and decided that uh, not only two men would go and and we decided that Island could uh, go. He had the best horse, a better horse than I was riding. My horse was pretty well jaded because his was a camp horse and mine was a sheep herd horse and it had done all the work. So he and Emma Wiltsey and uh, Island and Emma Wiltsey and uh, Jim Ed Smith and Hennerville uh, put Ken Golden on and led him up that old Peria Creek and Island said that was the worst day of his life facing that old north wind and I started out it was just potholes where the the mule would step out of one hole into another hole in about uh, two and a half to three feet of snow hard solid crusted snow and I hadn't gone very far when I got into the worst of it where the drifts was bad that uh, I could see blood every time they stepped out the hind mule stepped out why the snow would be red with blood where the it broke the hide on the front of their legs and, and uh, when I got to hatches from Panguage sheep herd they were just dead sheep it just looked like they laid down and went to sleep but they were frozen to death I rode into the camp and there's three jolly boys Leighton Jolly and Birch Jolly and Earl Jolly herding those sheep and it got so cold they'd come to camp and they were just sitting around drinking coffee and but I didn't stay I rode right on because I didn't know what condition dad was in he was alone but anyway when I got there why everything had uh, was in fairly good shape and uh, during this terrible winter why Claude Sedwick rode into camp it was just dad and I there then and he said uh, sam you've got to get home as fast as possible he said your wife has give birth to a baby a premature baby says it's a little you can put it in a quart bottle and uh, so dad left and one morning claude said it's got up it's snowing and he went out and we had the mules tied to two different trees with their hind ends towards each other and just a walking space between and he unbuckled the the blankets that we put on the mules in the winter time to keep them warm and he unbuckled them and got right between the two mules not thinking and began to pull the two uh, blankets off together and they begin to kick and he knew his only chance of life was to fall and uh, so he fell right down in the deep snow and uh, they were kicking over him I heard him scream and uh, I rushed out of the tent island had gone on old simples one of our horses that uh, we called her simple because she was just different than any other horse we'd ever had and uh, he was riding away and he heard Claude scream and I rushed out and got down on my hands and knees and got a hold of Claude and brought him out and he had a pair of little old gold rimmed uh, glasses on and the snow had got between the glasses and his eyes and I couldn't see his eyes and I got him out I was sure he was dead Island come around he kept saying is he dead is he dead I said I don't know but I believe so finally Claude said no I'm not 
No, I'm not. That was sweet music to my ears. Well, that terrible hard winter had lots of uh, peculiar things. We had a blue jay, and uh, he'd come right into the tent. We'd feed him. If we had a little bit of tired old bread, why, he'd feed him. He, every morning he was there for breakfast. And uh, finally the rest of the birds in the flock become... Uh, so hungry, and he became so vicious that he even killed other birds. He he just fight them and kill them, and he just become mean. And I thought of the uh, Book of Mormon when it said Nephi, it's better that one man should perish than a whole nation dwindle in unbelief. And I thought, well, it's better that one bird should pass away than than, than the whole flock. And so. I decided to get rid of him, and uh, I did. And then we had all the birds. Uh, they'd come in and uh, eat anything that was out of camp, just beg for something to eat. they just come like a bunch of chickens. And that was quite exciting. I remember when the snow uh, fell away, uh, Uncle Ammon Davis and I, we pulled a boat over to Buckskin Gulch. It's a big, deep gorge. It's the only canyon that goes through the Kaibab plateau except Grand Canyon, and uh, there we uh, put the old, old sheep, the gummers, uh, the poor ones, down in there because there was early bunch grass on the south side, and Uncle Ammon and I was riding along, and he had a very sharp eyes, and he had his six-shooter on his side, and, and this was quite an exciting day for me, you know, and, but anyway, we looked up through the cedars, and there was a sheep standing. And so we rode up to it, and it was standing up. It had been dead for months and froze to death without anything in its stomach, and it was just uh, skin and bone, a little wool over it, and its feet was stuck down in the mud about four feet, I mean four inches, all the way down. And it was just standing up there like a normal sheep. We studied it for a few minutes and talked about it, then we rode back over to the rim, jumped a bunch of deer, and that six-shooter come out like a flash of lightning, and Uncle Ammon shot one with that six-shooter, and it jumped over the gorge and fell several hundred feet down in the bottom, and we crawled off down in there and worked ourselves down to it and got the hindquarters and, and packed those out. Well, these are just experiences of, of sheep herding. And my life uh, in the summertime with a sheep herd, I spent two summers on the Griffin Mountain, and Dad gave me a 22, a little old single shot uh, uh, Springfield 22 and a thousand bullets. And uh, I learned to shoot. That's where I learned to shoot. I learned to where I could shoot a hawk out of the air flying. And uh, that was an enjoyable summer. Many, many experiences, bears coming into camp, and... Uh, scaring us half to death. Uh, it was quite a, quite a summer. and uh, But the main thing, uh, I guess, that I got out of sheep herding until I quit in 37 or 38, I guess it was 1938 when I quit herding sheep. Uh, I guess the greatest lesson that I learned was the beauty of the breast of Mother Nature. I learned to young in life, that nature has a soul. It's one of the greatest educational forces on earth, her love. And to understand Mother Nature, it takes time, meditation. It takes time to ponder the things you've seen and witnessed. But I had the Book of Mormon and I had the Bible at all times out to the sheep herd, and what a pleasure it was was to read the historical account of this earth by our prophets, and then to actually witness the great stairwall between Rice Canyon Rim and the floor of the Grand Canyon. I went out to Grand Canyon in 1932 and took a trip down uh, the old trail of those days, and uh, to understand the earth crust and all of its splendor chapters upon chapters of different geology and learn the names and learn the 
what man had uh, thought happened and then correlate it with the scriptures. And I begin to perceive at a very early age that geology that was man-made had too many lies. I begin to perceive that archaeology had too many lies. Geology and archaeology and paleontology, they did not coincide with the scriptures. And of course, the in my life, the scriptures took uh, precedent over all of other hypotheses and suppositions that man. And when man gets back into the ages, the archaic history of this earth, and put it beyond the 14,000 years, then they are just out in left field. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just idle dreamers. And uh, it's getting worse in this enlightened day, the Thomas Gage in eight. 1984 it's much worse than it was when I was a child because to go with their explosive scientific inventions uh, such as outer space and all of these things it just uh, they've just it just illuminated their minds into the most deceptive beguiling lies that was ever told because God is the author and the architect of all the universe and his word to his prophets is the only authentic truth we have on this earth. There's no argument. Man in his weakness of the arm of flesh cannot tell the truth because he is too belligerent, too austere, to uh, study the scriptures and believe them. Man was put on this earth to have faith and to live by faith and to believe with faith. And that's one of the lessons that I begin to learn about Mother Nature because her breast is so beautiful and so ample. Uh, you can trust Mother Nature. She never told a lie in her life. It's man that deceived. And the big dark secret of deception and lying came with when Cain and Satan got their heads together and formed the great dark secret of deception, which is rampant upon the earth as never before. Well, the lessons I learned while I was sheep herding, I learned that the Priya River, which was uh, constituted the biggest part of my life as a sheep herder, I learned uh, that uh, the Priya River is the most beautiful tributary of the whole Colorado River. As it now is constituted, it has two national parks on it. It has Lee's Ferry, where it confluences with the Colorado River in Arizona, and Bryce Canyon National Park at its head. It also has five fingers. We have over on the east side the Kaibab monocline, locally called Cottonwood Wash, and one of the greatest fault structures on the face of the earth, great monocline. And then we come into what we call Hackberry, and between Hackberry and Cottonwood Wash is what we call Rush Bed Mountain. And then we have what we call Death Valley, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And then we have the Priya River, the main middle artery of the Priya River. Then we have Sheep Creek. And then we have uh, what we call the Buckskin Gulch. And the Buckskin Gulch is after it gets into the lower primitive part of the Priya River, has another big canyon coming in called Wire Fence Gap. That's the south boundary of the Priya drainage, just this side of the Arizona line, and it's perhaps one of the deepest earthquake tracks in the entire world. Well, Sheep Creek has one of these great colossal earth cracks called Bull Valley Gorge leading into it, and Willis Creek. All of them in their morphology and their sculpture dignity this makes the Priya River beyond any shadow of a doubt. It has over 20 arches and natural bridges, and some of these natural bridges are very large. Uh, and uh, some of the temples of the Priya are absolutely flawless in their sculptured beauty, where Mother Nature has uh, carved out uh, the windows. And to ride by them when I was a youngster, and as I grew into manhood, Oh, what a pleasure it was. I remember 
one time Island and I was in what we call Lower Death Valley. I uh, told Island to put the camp on a certain place where we liked to camp because it was quite high and you could see everywhere. And I had the sheep all spread out. It was getting long towards evening. I sat down in the moist sand. This was in March. And there had been some warm days and the sand had thawed out. And I was just digging in the sand, sitting in the sagebrush, and with my right hand digging in the sand, and all at once I dug up a piece of pottery. I turned around and got down on my knees and then just put my hand in a scooping condition, both hands together, and scooped the sand off about six inches. And there was two perfect pots. I have still one of them in my home today. One was a broken, and uh, the other one was the red one was completely perfect. I rode into camp that night just with the red one. I didn't in those days. I didn't pay any attention if a pot was broke. I'd know better to do that. I'd pick it up and glue it back together. But in those days, I didn't do those things. Didn't have no way to pack them. I rode into camp that night, and I said to Island, uh, "Will you please uh, have uh, get the milk out?" Uh, we'll have bread and milk. And then I said, I've got my bowl. And I said, we'll find you one. And but another time, we uh, was down on what they call West Beach. We'd run out of supplies. And so I told Island, I'll take the horses out to Pigeon Point where there's big ponds of water big enough to, to swim a horse. And I'll... Uh, water the horses but you go for supplies and as I come back there's a moving sand dunes out there moving from the south to the to the north on the north side of the sand dunes there the trees are all green and on the south side they're all dead and as I rode around this why I saw a tree stump sticking out all charred with black and pottery all around it I got off my horse and shook the tree a little bit and more pottery rolled out so I got on my horse and rode over to the rim looking off in the buckskin gulch and got a flat rock like a, a hole and come back and use my hands as a handle on the hole and uh, I began to dig around this stump and in a little while, about an hour's time, I had 19 pots, some of them as big as three and four gallons and uh, some of them had little pots inside them and all together there was 19 and I still have some of those to this very day in the little museum. There was uh, three spearheads and bone awls, and all of the pots had something like seeds, and some of the bigger pots had, were cooking pots, they were black. Whatever happened, I, uh, analyzing, I guess this group of people, the Indians living there, got surprised and had to flee for their lives. And uh, what these pots on the fire, the food in them just simply burned up, and uh, then the the sand dune covered them up, and I, that's how I found them. Well, so many things like that. I remember one day in, in, uh, down in Lower Death Valley, I riding along through some little rough breaks, and I saw some black sand. I knew a fire, ancient fire had been built there, because I could see, see a few flint chips. I got off my horse because I could see a head of a purple arrowhead, just ahead of it. And I got off, and I just moved a little dirt, oh, maybe six or eight inches away, and there was the point, and it just fit perfect. I still have that in my collection. I re remember uh, so many, many little things like this was my schoolhouse, and this is where I got my education. And uh, I remember riding one day, I see something white under a tree, and I went over there, and it was a skull of American Indian, and Mother Nature done covered it. And uh, I never knew just what my lesson would be by Mother Nature, uh, but wherever I went, I went into every nook and crease. I studied the contour, the morphology, the beauty. I studied everything that could be studied. I didn't have time to spend my time reading trash. I just went into Mother Nature and read her beautiful breath and received her diploma of education younger in life as I graduated from her school of hard knocks and her school of uh, deep intelligence because 
she become my everyday life friend year after year for many years. Sheep herding was an art, and it was a gamble because you never knew whether you was going to have a hard winter or a good winter. And sometimes the springs was very, very poor. And in the springtime, they would chase the grass and the flowers, and they become very hard to manage. One time, I remember we, Island and I moved out of what we called Death Holler, 